Letter from President Michael D. Higgins, 1st of September 2023. To the Right On Group, may I convey my warmest greetings and best wishes to all in the Right On Group as you prepare for Culture Night 2023. Since its inception in 2017, the Right On Group's dedication to fostering a vibrant and supportive writing community and promoting the appreciation of literature within the Galway community and beyond is a testament to the power of artistic expression and its ability to connect people from diverse backgrounds. I am delighted to learn that this year's Culture Night programme will include the launch of the Write On Anthology 2024 and I commend the efforts of each member of the group for your commitment to fostering creativity, encouraging diverse perspectives and nurturing a sense of community. I send on my best wishes and I hope that you all have a very successful and enjoyable Culture Night 2023. Greetings from the Arts Office here in Galway County Council. I just wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate all of the members of the Write On Group on the publication of this year's two books, A Father's Love and Other Stories by Frank Fahey and the Write On Anthology 2024. Wishing you every success with your launch tonight, Culture Night. Thank you. Now let's push from Galway to Westport to meet our newest member. Hi, my name is Grit Mitch and I live and work in Westport County, Mayo. I'm a singer-songwriter and busker and visual artist and recently I joined the Right On Circle, looking forward to their encouraging words and to our creativity as I write songs and poems throughout the year. This is my favourite original, it's called Sunflower and I hope you enjoy it. I am no butterfly Stopping on a flower To leave again And dance in the wind I am no visitor Just on your sunny days To leave you When your gloomy days begin This is not Who I am
Symphony by Kira Kyo. I can smell tar bubbling in the sun, hear the grey chips erupting from the ponds of black lava, the smooth cracking of tires as they roll past the house, a tin box blotting heat waves into the air. The car winks at me through a gleam of light spinning around the room. The sun scorches the golden green grass. Dandelion seeds gather. Tumbleweeds in wall corners, twirling and dancing in a captured breeze. Towels whip and beat themselves on the clothesline. A warm breeze tickles my skin, making it itch, and I breathe in summer. The dog's pant rides the air. His nails click on concrete. Whistling gusts make the door slam, breaking him into a barking opera that fills me with anxiety. Moments later, he's settled again, resting his chin on my lap. Grounded and contented, I listen to the notes of a busy earth as trees sway in sync to Mother Nature's calming hum. The symphony ends in a fanfare of chirping, bidding me adieu. A lilting gale emerges from behind the trees, silhouetted in the hue of a pink and orange sky. I close summer behind me with a roll of the door. Looking forward to tomorrow. Hi, I'm Kira Kyo, and today we're diving deep into the wonders of Connemara. Our first stop, Gertine Bay. This isn't just any beach. It forms one half of an incredible tombolo, a Latin term meaning mound. Picture two spectacular beaches lying back to back, jutting proudly into the Atlantic's embrace. This pristine coastline owes its radiance to the white sands beneath, which are formed of countless seashell fragments. This means no sediment muddying the waters, just azure blue reflections of the sky above. Across this sand strip is its twin, Dog's Bay, recognisable by its unique bone-shaped spit of sand connecting it to the coastline. Both these beaches together are like a secret whispered by the wild Atlantic way. 
making this landscape arguably the most picturesque in County Galway. From here, let's cast our eyes over to the horizon. Here lies Inishlachan, an island, a beacon for artists. Since 2001, this island has seen the footprints of almost 100 artists, inspiring exhibitions from Roundstone to New York. Once, the island even turned into an open gallery for Culture Night in 2013. As night falls, our journey doesn't end. Instead, the captivating Roundstone Harbour emerges, shimmering under the moonlight, nestled against the majestic backdrop of the Erisbeg Mountain. Roundstone isn't just a village, it's a masterpiece, with flora that would make any botanist's heart flutter and a history enriched by its creator, the Scottish engineer Alexander Nemo. This village is a gem of Connemara. These beautiful places have been the inspiration for many of my poems. I'm delighted to say that some of my poems are included in the Write On Anthology in 2024. My Little Beach by Kira Kill. Engulfed in rugged Connemara bog, as froth licks away on curved shoreline, shaped in a perfect horseshoe, the seaweed surfs the gentle current rocking back and forth. I am at my most peaceful here, imagining America over the linear horizon, still oblivious to the vastness of the ocean. The cows high up to the left look so tiny, I pretend to hold them on my palm like I am Gulliver. Baked sand under my feet, I could stay here all day breathing in the scent I longed for all winter. The gentle swish, swash of the waves gliding ashore are a lullaby to my ears. Swallows dart in and out of holes in the dunes, their high-pitched chirping floating through the hazed air. An airplane passes over, buzzing in a nasally hum, as two seagulls outdo one another with their squawks. A heron brushes her belly against the sea's skin, silently melting into the silvery ocean. She emerges later in a furious panic with dinner in tow and swoops off to the pillow-like mountain. The breeze quickens its step as darkness rolls in on the bay. Sea blisters sweep inwards, kisses from the sky on my nose. Time to go home. But first, a bowl of chowder in Roundstone. Greetings, I'm Mary Rose Tobin and I'm proudly clutching a treasure, our Write On Anthology 2024. Here in the heart of Galway, my birthplace, this book feels right at home. Have a look at the cathedral, a majestic entity from my childhood. You'd be surprised to know it stands on the grounds of the old Galway jail a house of worship emerging from a place of confinement. The irony wasn't lost on the locals. This is the modern Salmon Weir and Pedestrian Bridge. My childhood memories flash by, narrow escapes as vehicles and pedestrians jostled for space on the old bridge. Today, as I walk this new path, I bask in serene Corrib River views, marvelling at its roaring descent to the sea. How do the salmon, year after year, swim against such force to reach the fertile waters of Loch Corrib? The river, as you'll see, is embraced by exquisite walkways. Here, 
my past on thrills, gruelling swim practices and tranquil rows on sunlit afternoons. Now we have the Town Hall Theatre, a phoenix risen from a cinema's ashes. It pulsates with artistic life during the Galway Arts Festival and beyond. Here stands my alma mater, the University of Galway, its famed archway guarding the Aula Maxima. It's where friendships flourished and, yes, where knowledge was earnestly pursued. Take a moment with me, nestled between Oscar Wilde and Edward Wilde. These statues, icons of Galway, captivate, even if their real-life counterparts never met. Wilde's presence, a gift, when Estonia embraced the EU in 2004. Galway's literary spirit thrives in its bookstores. As I stride towards Dubray's, with Lynch's castle watching over, anticipation bubbles. Will last year's anthology grace their shelves? The sheer array of books always astounds me. And, speaking of which, there is Frank Fahey's work, mischievously pegged as a bestseller. Classic Frank humour. Vibrant marketplace buzzes under the watchful eye of St Nicholas's Cathedral, a spot where local arts and eager tourists melt. Now, Nora Barnacle's home beckons. Her relationship with James Joyce, a whirlwind of passion, was legendary. His words for her, filled with anticipation and longing, resonate deeply. Their story, wrapped in devotion and inspiration, is an intricate dance of fact and fame. Every Galwegian will declare Hertridge's as their beloved sausage brand, though its original shop has closed its doors. And across, Lynch's window, a testament to a father's painful justice. From history to artistry, a mural of the late Rory Gallagher stands tall, merging art and music in a sweeping embrace. To conclude our journey, join me at the erstwhile Great Southern Hotel, now the Hardyman. A soothing tea awaits. I hope this glimpse of Galway enchants you, as it does me. Do indulge in my tale, The Dead Language Teacher, from our Write On Anthology 2024, a narrative rooted deeply in the city of tribes. The Dead Language Teacher by Mary Rose Tobin I slipped into a pew at the back of the cathedral. The familiar soaring ceilings, stained glass windows, walls adorned with beautiful frescoes and sculptures, and floors of polished marble brought me back to my childhood days growing up nearby. A small girl, picking blackberries along the ruined walls of the old jail. 
From the window of our house on Canal Road, we saw the new building gradually rising like a phoenix. As a child, I came here with my family to 12 o'clock Mass every Sunday. I especially loved when my brother sang the treble solo from the choir balcony. Even though I became agnostic in my teens, and my heart is firmly set against the institutions of the Catholic Church, this building has never failed to make me feel calm and soothed. In front of me, a congregation of mourners filled the pews. Candles flickered warmly beside the coffin in front of the altar. A faint scent of candle wax filled the air, intermingled with the hint of incense and flowers from a previous ceremony. The organ played sombre music, interrupted intermittently by a murmur of conversation or an occasional sob. Waiting for the ceremony to start, my mind began to drift. Fifth year. The school a hotbed of adolescent energy. Our group of girls, full of mischief and rebellion, giggling and whispering, the latest gossip, the hottest boys. How often did we sneak out of the school grounds for a clandestine rendezvous, nascent hormones raging through our bloodstreams? Let's go for a smoke. Or a quick snog? Boys from the nearby secondary school and students from the university were on hand to supply both. Studying was the last thing on our minds. It was a badge of honour to be a rebel. The corridors echoed with laughter at our latest circumvention of the rules. Our pranks were legendary. The Hulk convention was a classic. We dyed the fountain green and immersed ourselves, uniforms and all, to emerge as strange creatures from outer space. It took ages to remove the dye from our skin. The uniforms never recovered. Someone thought of renaming the hit song to A Whiter Shade of Green. Missing by Kathleen Phelan My own place is this winding lane with tufts of grass like sleeping hedgehogs in the centre. Lichen and moss have turned the humpback bridge into a chameleon. Any moment now it will unroll its long sticky tongue. In a flash I will disappear. The search party will find no traces, only the pink straw hat with red poppies my sister Molly gave me for my 90th birthday. My name is Kathleen Phelan and I'm a member of the wonderful group Right On. I'm here in the medieval city of Kilkenny where I was born and reared. It's a small, compact city that attracts well over a million visitors every year. Glen Mouse by Kathleen Phelan Glen Mouse lives in our attic. I can hear him from my bed. When man me thinks I've gone to sleep, I play with him instead. He comes down from the ceiling through a tiny secret door. We jump for hours on my bed and do karate on the floor. He then creeps back up to his room to rest himself and dream. If I told Mammy about Len, she'd scream and scream and scream. Most pubs have traditional Irish music which is very popular with locals and visitors alike.
Within a mile, you can visit most of the important buildings. In August every year, we have Kilkenny Arts Festival and, as the name implies, caters for every type of art imaginable. Supernova by Kathleen Phelan Half-wit walking, carrying your bag of dreams in the crook of your elbow. Lying about how you came from the place where the clouds meet the ocean. How you dipped your feet in salt water and joked with the fish. And you went out at dawn to help God lift the sun back into the sky. The children sniggered. The adults were suspicious. They remembered that your parents were odd. How your father chanted in the forest and your mother danced while the moon looked on. If you hadn't lied about the priest touching you, you would not be here rocking back and forth in the hospital for the criminally insane your bag of dreams spilling out on the floor like abandoned stars. A statue of our Kilkenny hurlers takes pride of place in Canal Square and every day visitors can be seen having their photos taken alongside it. Molly the Menace by Kathleen Phelan While my family are sleeping, I go out with my cat. She waits outside while I squeeze through the flap. We never hunt mice or kill little voles. Our Molly is much more interested in bowls. Last night we called to Mr. Butler's backyard and Molly went smashing while I stood on guard. She climbed up to the window and stood on the ledge while I looked on from a gap in the hedge. First terracotta, then ceramics, then glass. All came down to earth with a terrifying crash. And all from a swipe of her big furry mitt. She felt sorry for the flowers, but only a bit. This morning on my way up to school, I met Mr. Butler and I really felt cruel. Hi Sarah, he said, while sweeping the slivers. There was some wind last night, it would give you the shivers. The jewel in the crown has to be the castle. It was abandoned for years, until in 1967, when the sixth Marquis of Ormond sold it for 50 pounds to be restored and enjoyed by the people of Kilkenny. Overall, Kilkenny is a very vibrant city and a wonderful place to live. Here we see Kilkenny Marketplace, where locals and tourists enjoy shopping for fresh produce. As we delve deeper into Kilkenny's rich tapestry, we find ourselves at a poignant landmark, the Kilkenny Famine Memorial Garden. Adjacent to the Kilkenny train station, it is a stark reminder of Ireland's tragic past. Today it's been beautifully restored and incorporated into the McDonough Junction Shopping Centre. Here's Kathleen walking into the park. 
where she has a special connection. Kathleen Phelan's poem, Workhouse Child, is on permanent display in Macdonough Junction Memorial Garden, Kilkenny. Workhouse Child by Kathleen Phelan Your bones, your body structure lie here, and I am in awe. To kneel down and touch what was once your face would be a transgression. With eyes closed, I imagine I've put you back together, not as you were back then, but how you would wish to be. I dress you in white lace, with baby's breath and roses entwined in your red curly hair. We walk around Kilkenny, your hand clasped in mine. When a sudden downpour scatters the crowd, your laughter is contagious. Still standing at your grave, I open my eyes, reach down and touch what is now your face. Sirsha, you are immortal. Rest well, my beautiful girl. Hi, Anne Murray here. I'm a member of the Right Hand Group. I'm walking in Terryland Forest Park, just a few hundred yards from my house, and about 20 minutes walk from Air Square in the centre of Galway City. This is where I do a lot of my thinking. The walk was a lifeline during the Covid isolation, when we could only travel up to two kilometres from our home. We're blessed to have it on our doorstep. The Change by Anne Murray At the supermarket yesterday, my bill came to €42.37. Euro and 37 cents. I handed in a 50 note. Looking in my purse, I said, I can give you the 237. The cashier looked at me with a withering eye. I've already entered 50, she said. But if I give you the change, you can give me back a 10 euro note. She gave an audible sigh and threw her eyes up to heaven. The computer says that the change is 763. That's how much I have to give you. But, but, oh, forget it, I thought, putting all the change back in my purse. It got me thinking back to when I started work in 1962 as a post office clerk. We didn't have a computer to tell us the change. We didn't even have a calculator. Every calculation was done in the head. The supermarket cashier had only to deal with multiples of 10. We dealt in LSD. No, we were not dealing drugs. We were not high on acid. It was, from the Latin, libre solidi denari. In plain English, pounds, shillings and pence. An Irish letter stamp at the time was three old pence. So therefore, ten of them would be thirty pence. But there were twelve pence in a shilling. So thirty pence equaled two shillings and sixpence. Sixpence, a small silver coin with a greyhound on the back, was known as a tanner. A florin, a large silver coin with a salmon on the back, was two shillings. But two shillings and sixpence was half a crown, a large silver coin with a horse on the back. You could send a fairly large packet for a shilling. Ten of them would be ten shillings, so you could hand in a ten bob note. 20 shillings was a pound note. 
The shilling coin had a bull on the back, while the threepenny bit, a very small silver coin, had a rabbit on the back. Then came the copper coins. One penny, a large copper coin, with a hen with a clutch of chickens, and a halfpenny carried a sow with bonnets. The farthing was gone from use at this time, but there were still a few of them flying around with a woodcock on their backs. Not alone did we not have a calculator. We didn't even have a biro. We used an indelible pencil. An ordinary lead pencil would be raised with a rubber, but the indelible one, when wet on the tip of your tongue, wrote in purple and could not be rubbed out. Before the buds burst into leaves, as moonlight still seeps through, skeletal fingers, naked branches, able queen of the she, will walk unseen amongst us. She will dance and quietly sing to the chords of gentle breezes, plucking strings as she goes. Her magic harp foretells doom, the death of those that listen to this harpless, doleful tune. Goddess of fairies, on ace she, stay deep in your dark bound, make no deathly sound. My name is Seamus Kyo. I live in my Cullen, a village nestled in the uplands between the magnificent Corrib Lake and the sea in Galway Bay. Sea Legends by Seamus Kyo As a smoke grey curtain hangs low above the bay, thunderous waves crash on rattling shore stones. Seagulls in the sea sky with cantilevered wings soar, gliding high, tilting, wheeling, crying. Under the drab plumes the cormorant stands in shaggy wet feathers waiting to take flight. Dead herring scattered along the craggy shore, two fishermen drowned under blue salty waves. Gia, Manon and Maclear, with a sea-born chariot, this guardian of the sea, plucks souls to afterlife. The village sits under a canopy of constantly changing living skies with a rising morning sun glow from the east and a dying amber evening light in the west as it sinks behind the Arden Islands. Reflections by Seamus Kyo Gentle, calming movement of a river's flow. Busy buzzing of bees on a summer's day. Peaceful solace of calmness in my thoughts now. My mind rests in gentle harmony with creation as I listen to the melancholy of nature's quietest symphony. Chirping of birds, faint rustle of trees, distant rattle of cartwheels on winding roads. Alone, lost in my world and forgotten, I will not face the crushing night. I will depart in daylight. <laughs> The sky is often my inspiration as I try to see beyond its beauty into the secrets of the universe and the heavens. Yet, while tied to the earth, I look to my inner self for some reassurance of sanity. The pain is my saviour as I throw words and cobble sentences 
onto paper as aging satisfies itself gorging on my shrinking brain. Jealous Rage She had skipped and danced through the meadow that day. To the top of the hill she pranced, with arms outstretched she lay. Amid sounds mingled in haze, summer symphony filled the air. Cricket chirps, bird song days, a daisy chain placed in her hair. This innocent girl now despised, a dark heart trod the meadow, devil's evil in his slanted eyes, venom in his poisoned shadow. Like ancient roots torn asunder, pulled, broken, discarded aside, from resting in dark peace under, she would be no other's bride. He tore her soul from her being. Fragmented clouds passed by as the twilight curtains close to the dark of the night sky. His lonely face now looking down, the moon sat quietly in the night, a silver place with a sullen frown. Young flower lay cold, dead. Ukraine, like a ghost it passed, blue and black caped, in the periwinkle twilight, a dying spectre of time. This movement shaped spirit of doomed light, falling into dark night, the death of the day. How many will remain in the light of yesterday, how many will awaken to sunrise tomorrow. I suffer from diversity, prompting me to look beneath the earth, to the inner core, to hell, and also look to the stars and the creator for inspiration. I am an optimistic pessimist with a peculiar attitude to being alive and still having imagination. I owe a lot to the Write On group, my fellow writers, and mostly to Frank Fahey, who is a keystone in the art of all that is supporting the rest of us in our efforts to achieve some level of satisfaction with our writing. Hi, I'm Joyce Butcher and I'm speaking to you from Australia, where I'm currently staying in New South Wales, having just gone south from Queensland for our daughter's wedding. Now, by sheer coincidence, a particular story that has been included in the um, 2024 anthology for the wonderful Write On group, which I've been associated with for a few years, um, is one called The Wedding. And it's one I wrote this last year. Um, I would like to read you a, a little bit of that story, and hopefully you will be reading the rest of it in the anthology from page seven. So here we go. The Wedding by Joyce Butcher. Agni sat on her cushion as a swarm of butterflies did backflips in her stomach. Her husband-to-be, Devaj, sat beside her, his back straight, his facial expression stern, his eyes unswervingly fixed on some object in front of him. Agni sensed an arrogance in the man, especially in his unwillingness to turn and smile at her, as he had tentatively in yesterday's ceremony. Both bride and groom were dressed in colorful wedding clothes, bright pink, white and orange, trimmed with gold-colored satin and embroidered with gold-colored thread. Yesterday, Agni was filled with the excitement and hope as the marriage stories and rituals were performed. 
yet she felt a sense of the future being revealed to her and it seemed quite beautiful. But today, the day of the most formal and lasting rituals to solidify this union, she wondered if she had been deceived by this handsome man who seemed to have transformed himself into a different creature today. What did this mean, screamed a voice in her head. To the left of Agni and Devaj sat Priya, Agni's sister, two years younger, and her groom, Charun. Priya seemed very relaxed as she perched on her cushion like a well-fed cat. Charun looked kind, with large brown eyes and an easy smile. He gently touched Priya's hand when he turned to speak softly to her, which made her lean her head towards him, a smile tugging at her voluptuous lips. To the right of Agni and Devaj, Chakriya, the youngest sister of Agni, was sitting as if she were trying to fight a battle to contain the boundless energy within herself. She twisted this way and that, her dark eyes flashing in various directions as she subtly bounced up and down on her cushion. She swayed to the music the musicians had begun to play, but in double time. Her groom, Arav, sat with a small frown on his face, biting his lower lip. He had tried to get Chakriya to settle a bit, but her overexcited state prevented his gestures from being effective. The three sisters were not from a wealthy family, but had the good fortune to possess beauty that came from their mother, unsurpassed by all other women in the village of Ladlahari in western Bengal. The village tended to be ignored by tourists and neighboring towns alike, as it had no amazing architecture, had produced zero important artisans or famous cricket players, and even the local power supply was incapable of producing steady, reliable service. And that's where I'll stop. I hope you'll read the rest in the anthology. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Brian Ferguson. I grew up in Uktarad, where I still live with my family. It's a village about 23 kilometers outside of Galway city, and the beautiful Owen Riff River flows through it and down into Loch Carb. Both of these waterways and the lovely countryside around my village provide great inspiration for me and my writing. My poem, We Remember, is part of Anthology 2024, I'm very happy to say. I hope you enjoy it and the rest of the fantastic writing done by the Right On Group. We Remember. I drove west and north through Connemara narrow valleys and narrower roads. A stand of oaks, silent sentinels around the old lodge. Numbered salmon beats punctuate the Arab's course. Heatherclad hills close on either side, compact containing. Holding before giving way to the big reveal, Dulac and the valley, its magnificent mirrored surface almost oval framed by mountains. Majestic Muilray, across to the west, forbidding, fierce, immense. A pair of boats that seem permanently in waiting on the shore in the natural harbour of the small horseshoe bay. Have they ever seen use? Onward, tracing the lake's margin, bleak or beautiful, depending on your time and place. Near the top of the hill, the monument resounds. Dark echoes of that doomed famine walk from Lewisburg to Delphi our own trail of tears. Something stirs in me, every time. My heart grows warm and big in my chest. Breath catches. The Choctaw heard of losses like this and others and gave. Kindness, generosity, mercy. A bond was forged that slept, first through distance, then time. A memory too, stronger than hatred and anger at our oppressors. And now we reciprocate, 
Navajo and Hopi genes vulnerable to the latest Western plague because of the first. A faint, weak call for help. This call heard by the Irish at home and elsewhere. We answered the call, and how? Our Native American brothers and sisters wonder at this generosity from green shores and hearts and souls far away. They had forgotten. We had not. My name is Bill Gagan. I joined Right On Group some years ago, and I love the feedback and reaction they give to my songs. Judy and I are here in Connecticut, USA at the moment, having traveled to New York, Florida, and Maine the last few weeks. But my heart lies in Galway. Here is a song I recorded and performed in the Barna Woods titled Satchel Malloy. It's the tale of a young lad growing up in Galway whose best friend is Satchel. You never do find out the gender. Satchel unfortunately dies, but just the sound of the name brings back such wonderful memories. I hope you like it. Oh, Satchel Malloy, Satchel Malloy, the sound of it brings me such joy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. At Barna Woods we would play, as knights we would slay, the dragons who'd seek us as prey. Then grabbing our gear, we'd walk down from here for a swim in the cool Galway Bay. Oh, Satchel Malloy, Satchel Malloy, the sound of it brings me such joy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. With stories and songs, Satchel kept me regaled as we made our way into town. Then taking a film while sharing the treat and hiking our way homeward bound. Oh, Satchel Malloy, Satchel Malloy, the sound of it brings me such joy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. Then came the day when I waited forever for Satchel to appear at my door. But to the good Lord, the soul had been given of my best friend Satchel Malloy. Oh, Satchel Malloy, Satchel Malloy, the sound of it brings me such joy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. Oh, Satchel Malloy, Satchel Malloy, if you sing it, you will feel joy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. When I was a lad, my closest of friends was the wonderful Satchel Malloy. Hello there, I'm Nolik O'Donnell. I've always found solace in the written word and the embrace of nature. I'm blessed to be a part of the Right On group and to live amidst the beauty of Galway, right on the wild Atlantic way. Today, I'd like to take you on a journey with me, down a path that's very close to my heart. 
This is Tuberena, the holy well at Barna Wood. It's not just a well, it's a spiritual refuge. Legend has it that Saint Enda himself stopped here in the 5th century on his journey to the Iron Islands. They say as he prayed, this well miraculously sprang to life. To this day, people from far and wide come to pay homage, and if you look closely, you might even see the gleaming pennies they leave behind. Some believe its waters have healing powers, especially for those with ailments of the eyes and ears. And just beyond these woods, look at this. The magnificent Galway Bay with the hills of Clare cradling it from afar. Scenes like this stir poetic inspiration in me. And here we are at Silver Strand. Whether it's the children's laughter, the windsurfers dance with the waves, or the contemplative strolls of wanderers, this place is alive with stories. It's here that I often find the words for my poems and tales. Every ripple in the water, every gust of wind, whispers stories waiting to be penned. And over the years, I've tried to capture some of these tales in the write-on anthologies. I'd be honoured if you took the time to immerse yourself in them. But before we part, let me share a piece I've written, inspired by this very place. It's titled, To Live the Book. I choose to read to save my soul. In full control I'll be. Take my book to a quiet nook and therein find the key. And so I delve into the depths, scale the heights, cross the seas. Dreams and schemes of other people, no cause of fear for me. Adventures and advice, I read, science and poetry. The sacred scriptures, yes, the word, I study avidly. And then one day, the book takes life. Fate sends a trial to me. With reading done and wisdom won, no challenge should this be. But oh, the shock! The cross to lift, the pain, the cup to drink. The printed word, no substitute. No passion flares in the ink. Nolik Naman, Anne McManus. Tranona and Darala Jag na Nolik, Mukum and Quinnel than Ojernok. Weahus in Machri, a guil on Fane, Gamerimich Bio Eranam Shaharish. Na Ijer Lehen the Shin, being sheath my trave Shishkiha, nor a chain and shan blean a mach, Martija Ectillo, and was taken on Athblean as Jack a cune in Smahishkit. The Ahas and Shanbliana, Martashke in Machri, Nis Lukur na Order Be, Dohus Freshen Riven Blian Nua, Am Amian and Dudra Eg Muskelsh. Be a Meg Brano Arash, Eserai, Ach Nero Ada Eg Yachter Tro, Wool Neblienta Quich Tishkinch Dom. Gia Yev Galer as Karna Galeva. My name is Anne McManus, and I'm a member of the Raishan group here in Galway. Books have always been part of my life, from the time I could read. I still have my first reader from the 1946 first class in the Ursuline Junior School in Sligo. 
However, the idea of writing never entered my head until 1999, when I joined Salt Hill Active Retirement, through which the opportunity arose to join a writing group under the tutorship of Myra Holmes. The material for my poems and stories came from those moments which I had noticed throughout my long life. Moments which make me stop and think. They can be funny, poignant, quirky, breathtaking, mysterious, sad and often beautiful. An old man walking his dog, children playing, a couple arguing, sunlight on my fridge door. I was fortunate to join the Write On group in 2019 and since then have published a book of poems, New Dawn and a book of short stories, A Day for Red. From time to time, like all writers, I have been afflicted by writer's block. When the imagination hits the wall and it seems I will never get back to writing. However, time spent in my garden and swimming in the sea gradually energises me. Taking up writing was one of the best things to happen in my life and the good news is anyone can try it. morning. Can I speak to Tommy? Which Tommy would you be looking for now? The Tommy who comes to the Galway Market on a Saturday. Oh, that Tommy. He goes to my Cullen of a Friday. That's the very man. Well, he doesn't be here of a Monday. Oh, I see. Uh, the poor old devil has to get over doing the Fridays and the Saturdays. Early start them days, five o'clock in the morning. Sure enough, he needs the rest. Sure, we'd get no good out of him at all if he was to come in of a Monday. The other Tommy is out the back making sausages up to his elbow, saying, Mate, will I get him? No, 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 not at all. Sure, you can take the order yourself. What's your name? I'm Joe. We have two Joes here, Towny Joe and Colchie Joe. That's me, Colchie Joe. Right, so, Joe, I need an eight to ten pound bronze truck. Before you go any further now, ma'am, them are all gone. Well, they're still out the field running around, but they're all booked up. They have labels on them. Not one left. All we have now are 16 pounds and over. Dolly Pardons, we do call them ones. Oh, no. And I thought I was in good time. Well, the ways it is this year, ma'am, a lot of people are staying at home, not going to hotels like they used to, in case the old virus would be there ahead of them. That virus is an awful curse coming all the way from China. It is indeed, Joe. So what about the turkey? Oh, could you do a half turkey, Joe? On the length, if you know what I mean. Holy Mother of God, ma'am, that would be a terrible thing to do. What about a crown? No, Joe, no brown meat with it. So it will have to be the half. And what about the stuffing, ma'am? So there's no cavity to put it in. Joe. I haven't put the stuffing in the turkey since we were told the cavity is full of germs and... You're right there, ma'am. The sister-in-law had a dose of the skittles for a week after eating stuffing from the cavity. We do have a goose ourselves with the potato and the onion stuffing. Joe, about the half turkey, be sure to send in the gizzard, the heart and the liver. Of course, ma'am. Sure, it's the only way to make decent gravy. The young ones know to make it out of a packet full of chemicals. I sure most of them don't know how to cook a turkey these days. They get the slices from the supermarket and the stuffing too. Now, ma'am, are you nearer to Galway or my cullen? I'm in Galway, Joe, but I'll collect in my cullen. Going into town is a nightmare with the traffic. Galway traffic? A few months back I was driving into Galway and when I seen the line going on to the roundabout near Galway what did I do? Only a Yui in the middle of the road and went home. My Cullen saw Joe on the 23rd. Grand ma'am and wouldn't you be the foolish woman to go into Galway market Christmas week putting yourself in danger rubbing up against all sorts and making maybe ending up with a bed for the Christmas. That's all grand now Joe. 
Holy Mother of God, didn't I forget to get your name, ma'am? But don't worry, I have it all written into the book here. The talk is a bad job sometimes. It is indeed, Joe. Happy Christmas to you. Happy Christmas to you too, ma'am, and all belonging to you. Hello, my name is Mary Hudson. I joined Write On just over a year ago. I have met some inspirational writers who have supported and encouraged me on my writing journey. I live on the Sligo Leitrim border. I enjoy the beauty of Yeats's country and the many walks over the River Shannon. My short stories are reflections on my childhood, growing up on the family farm, where the home place is a short distance from these familiar walks and paths. I hope you enjoy these reminiscences with me. Christmas Eve by Mary Hudson. We sat around in the warm kitchen in the centre of our home. The Stanley Eight was throwing out intense heat from the turf and sticks added by our father earlier in the evening. The turf was saved on the family bog in the summer and stored adjacent to our house. The sticks were cut and blocked by our father who had worked in the forestry throughout his working life. He recognised a good hardwood from the less efficient spruce. These harvested sticks were brought home by horse and cart throughout the spring and summer months, ensuring there were sufficient heating supplies for the winter. Having a glowing fire, which offered solace and cosiness, was especially important at Christmas. The kitchen was decorated with homemade paper chains, blue, green and red, streaming across the high ceiling. The small fir Christmas tree occupied its usual place in the corner. The multicoloured glass bulbs placed on its delicate branches reflected the glowing flames emanating from the range. The kitchen had acquired its usual Christmas deep clean. The chair legs were scrubbed. The Sacred Heart, Our Lady and Pope John the Twenty-Third got a good dusting and a paint touch-up. The wallpapering with its mosaic design interspersed with flowers, created a verdant ambience. The small wooden crib was placed with reverence on the windowsill. Abundant red-berried holly adorned the surround. The doors leading off the kitchen to the bedrooms, bathroom and back kitchen were painted. A 20-pound turkey had roamed around the farmyard a few days earlier, unaware of its fate. My father had wrung its neck and plucked it. Mother stocked it, ready for the oven. Our chores were finished. Christmas was a special time in our house. We counted the weeks in anticipation. Christmas Eve was especially significant. Santa was coming. We listened to the wireless most of the afternoon. We waited for our names to be called out by Santa, telling us that he was calling to our house in Carno. I never remember our names being called out. In our innocence, we did not realise until much later that a letter to Santa needed to be posted to the radio station for names to be mentioned on the wireless. One Christmas Eve stands out in my memory. The house was a hive of busyness. The fire was continuously stoked. The smell of turf and sticks lingered. Outside, the smoke streamed upwards towards a clear, moonlit, 
starry night sky. The air was crisp and frosty. We were very excited. We believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Santa was due to arrive any minute. Father sat on a three-legged stool milking in the cow bar which was attached to the lower gable of the home place. The cows had names. Moran, she was blind. The black, she was gentle. The old grey, she had arthritis in her back legs. She could unintentionally kick out as you walked behind her. How to avoid the dangerous flaying of her hooves was an art that we mastered. We enjoyed going to the bar to watch father milking. The smell of fresh hay mixed with distinctive cow smells is a fragrance that remains with me to this day. The rhythm of the chewing of the cud, coupled with the hissing sound of fresh milk expertly drawn from each teat, is a symphony that I recall with great joy. As each strand of milk streamed into the bucket, a white, frothy foam formed on the surface. Father continued milking until each of the six otters was emptied. Sometimes a squirt of warm milk landed on our faces in devilment. We shouted in shock, attempting to avoid the next squirt. Father enjoyed the fun. The milk was cooled and strained. Some was set aside for the family. The remainder was placed in a can for transport to the local creamery. This milk supplied much needed income to supplement the family budget, especially at Christmas time. On the night in question, when the milking was finished, Father said, Did you hear that? I think he's landed. Look up there now on the roof. See if he's arrived. We ran out of the bar and looked up at the roof of the house. We expected and truly believed that Santa was on the chimney and about to make his descent with our presence. We stood motionless, with our eyes focused on the chimney pot, shivering with fear, expectation and excitement. We were abruptly shaken out of our trance by our father emerging from the byre. Ah, sure, you weren't fast enough. You missed him. Go on now up to the house and check in the room. I bet he has come. He's awful quick, you know. We ran from the byre up to the kitchen and down to the lower room, our parents' bedroom. There, laid out in a row, were our presents, each neatly parceled, labelled with our names. We leapt around in excitement, tearing open our parcels, while shouting over each other, I got a tin whistle, I got a drum, I got a cloth doll, I got a French fiddle, I got a tea set, I got a gun holster and caps. Snakes and ladders, ludo, drafts and packs of playing cards also emerged. Mother had great trouble rounding us all up for our special Christmas Eve tea. Eventually we took our places around the kitchen table. The feast before our eyes made us forget our newly opened presents as we savoured the delightful fare. Sausages, soda cake, porter cake and a tin of USA biscuits adorned the table. Special treats for a special night. I look back now with memories of an innocent time. Simple, pleasurable enjoyments. My family of eleven provided our own entertainment. We created a magical time and Christmas Eve in the home place that lasts forever. My name is Jutta Rosen and I live in the small town of Brandenburg, not far from Berlin. It's a picturesque place of old buildings and beautiful watercourses, a stress-free environment which allows me to follow my own thoughts and ideas. I lived in Ireland in the past and some years ago a friend there introduced me to the Write on Zoom group in Galway. 
With their encouragement and guidance, I started on a long cherished project, which was to write a novel set in Berlin during the war. The creativity and the research involved have provided me with immense enjoyment. The latest result of the group's work is now available in our Write On Anthology 2024, full of wonderful poems, short stories and songs, and it also includes the following excerpt from my novel. I do hope you'll enjoy reading it as much as we enjoyed our writing. Jutta Rosen, A Normal Couple, Part 1 Opening of Chapter 20, 18th of May, 1941 And some background information um, It was not just food that was rationed at this time But also clothing and sewing material Lo, what do you think of this new fashion for the summer? Those funny puff shorts under an open skirt Aren't they a bit daring? Why, do you need something for the beach? Well, yes, I could do with something practical that I could walk about in and then just quickly change into for sunbathing. Do you think they'd suit me? Of course. I think they look pretty and summery, and you'd find them useful even inside the house if it got very hot. Do you have any material? Elizabeth chipped in. I have a summer dress that doesn't fit me anymore. I've hardly worn it. Wait, I'll get it. She hauled herself out of the outstretched garden chair and ran up the steps into the veranda. After a cold and long spring, the weather had been fine for several days, and Emma had brought Joe out to Zehlendorf to, to see his grandparents. It was a Sunday. Arthur, who had been in Italy for the week, was expected back shortly, and would come straight out to meet them here on his arrival in Berlin. They were expecting him for lunch. Elizabeth reappeared with a cotton dress on a hanger. It had sleeves which ended just above the elbow, a fitted bodice, and a long, loose skirt which reached almost to her ankles. The material had an off-white background with garlands of pale summer flowers arranged in parallel rows from top to bottom. Lolo regarded it with an expert eye. I could make a little jacket top with the bodice and the bottom of the skirt, she said but we'd need more material for the shorts. Or else I could use the skirt for the shorts and you could find matching material for a new skirt. What do you think? Could you not make a narrower skirt and then have enough material for both? asked Emma. And the shorts needn't be terribly puffy. Lo laughed. I'm two numbers smaller than Ma as it is, pleaded Emma. All right, all right, smiled Lo. Come inside and we'll take your measurements. Elizabeth kept an eye on the baby, babies while the girls were in the house. Joe was trying to walk, hauling himself up on anything his little hands could grasp, and Alex was starting to sit up on his own. Her heart swelled as she watched them, and a faint memory rose before her. The scent of recently cut grass, the gracious warmth of the early sun, The peacefulness of the Sunday morning. All this opened the window to a long-forgotten vision from the early days of her own motherhood. She and her sister Lotte were staying in Moulton, at the estate of her maternal grandfather. Emma was four and Anna just two. And while the children were crawling and playing in the long, dusty grass, she and Lotte, in voluminous cotton lawn blouses and ankle-length summer skirts, were watching the farmhands cutting the hay on a slope beyond the end of the extensive garden, a long row of them swinging their swishing scythes in unison across the endless meadow. It was just this picture she recalled, like a photograph. What was special about it? Had she been particularly happy? Had something unexpected happened? She didn't know. Why just this image?
the soul rising. Your dusk is rare, a purple mystery in all its nearness. A painting in stillness with brushes lying low, hunting forgeries out into the open. At the seeding of light, you become truth with oil and colours bustling in markets where flowers are fought over like jealous passions with the loser and his tongue sunken, his words loaned to failure in case golden vowels come to a rescue where a life boy scans the slightest sound dredging up whatever moves in the dark the sheen from silver shadows from fog a soul rising in the dark Greeting from Dublin's heartbeat, the Grand Canal. James Conway here, a humble vessel for words, prompted by the rhythms of this very canal. The Grand Canal begins in the Grand Canal dock at the Liffey and continues through to the Shannon. It passes through Ringsend, Ballsbridge, Renla, Rathmines, Harl's Cross and Crumlin. It's prompted a number of my poems and today this canal binds me to the right on group from distant Galway. Though miles apart, the magic of Zoom cancels distance, making kinship of kindred spirits possible. Look, summer's grace is upon us as stories come alive in whispered conversations, quiet musings and the gentle turning of a page. Is this serendipity? The book is in the young man's hands, the right on anthology 2024 an emblem of our shared literary journey. And here, a sanctuary, a bench dedicated to the name of the great Patrick Kavla. How many tales have echoed here of Kavanagh, Bean and Arnold and their spirits ever present, whispering tales that weave into Dublin's rich literary tapestry. So on this golden afternoon, a rendezvous with Frank Fahey from the Right On Group, an exchange of ideas inked on paper. And from my third collection, A Murmur of Ponies, finds a new reader. In return, the anthology, a testament to our shared legacy, rests in my hand. Would you indulge me? The first piece from my collection, A Necklace of Stars. A Necklace of Stars. In evening still, when those decades seemed like tinsel, or the confetti of his dreams, he'd stamp on the lonely road along the canal, over the quiver of the water, beside country reeds, his poetry came to life, if only for a moment, in the geometry of yesterday, with an image of stony fields, in the dark brown dark, under a cloudless sky, with a necklace of stars, telling of tomorrow, where dreams were laid out like a blanket. And all he ever wanted was there, a picnic amongst the city streets, with the coming of summer, sighted over the hill as he sat alone on Bagot Street Bridge with music wafting clear. November Days come at last with a chilling breeze and leaves whose hearts are crisping into a crumbling death scatter, only brought to life with a dance in the wind. Evenings darken quicker, and light has been sold to the highest bidder of a sorcery wrapping round our souls, leaving silence in its own pretense. The birds too dart in fright overlapping each other in a fight for scraps of food. And over coffee, a priest home for a visit from a Mary Kay laments about the churches being filled with breath. When November was on the tongues of spirits lost. November, month of lonely days, wearing your scarf, sown from roofs and steeples, where hawks sit quietly, coming to terms with ours strangely 
beyond their gaze. In rerum natura be praised. Richard O'Donnell is a dedicated, eco-friendly farmer nestled within the scenic landscapes of the Burren in County Clare. Farming isn't just an occupation for Richard, it's a privilege, a passion that intertwines deeply with the rhythms of nature. A particular source of delight for Richard are his three delightful donkeys. They're not just farm animals, but companions. At the mere rumble of Richard's car or a familiar call, these spirited creatures are quick to trot down the hill, always eager for a friendly pat or the occasional biscuit treat. The flaggy shore, immortalised by Seamus Heaney in his poem Postscript, holds a special place in Richard's heart. The serene shoreline serves as a refuge where the hush of nature stirs the writer's soul within him. Another of Richard's favourite retreats is the panoramic view of Galway Bay and the Burren on the walk up to the Martello Tower. The Burren's undulating landscapes and rich biodiversity are often the muses for Richard's literary endeavours. As an active member of the Write On group, he cherishes the open, candid critiques of his work, always delivered in a spirit of camaraderie and encouragement. Art and friendship often intersect for Richard at the Russell Art Gallery, located near the flaggy shore. Amidst a backdrop of stunning art and overlooking Galway Bay, he often shares moments of camaraderie over a cup of coffee with friends. Supporting the local community is integral to Richard's ethos. He often frequents the Veg Box, an honesty shop. It's not just a place to get fresh vegetables, but a testament to the trustworthiness and entrepreneurial spirit of the locals. But Richard's philosophy extends beyond farming and community. He firmly believes that the essence of farming should be grounded in safeguarding nature and all its inhabitants. These very species have, over time, given Richard profound insights into the eternal spirit of life. Through his writings, he hopes to convey his deep gratitude to these species and underscore the pivotal role humans play in being custodians of the earth. After a day drenched in the myriad tasks of farming, literature and community bonding, Richard makes his way back, drawing the curtains on yet another fulfilling day. <laughs> Flood and Fire Richard O'Donnell Our planet calls with flood and fire The news this time is really dire Our lives we truly must rewire We make a plan Humanity's inspired A carbon neutral life is now required Then Watch as the plan we botch. Sure, it's just another bureaucratic notch.
Hi everyone, I'm Judith David Gagan. I'm a member of the Write On group since 2020. Joining the group changed how I write about what I observe around me. For example, nature, a sunrise, the quiet of an evening, or the many issues that impact on our world and its people. I've learned to capture these moments differently in my writing. A lot of credit goes to my fellow Write On members. Their encouragement provides a nurturing environment for me as an aspiring writer to develop my skills. Thanks to Fang for producing this film and for his constant dedication to the Write On cause. I'm excited to share with you my poem titled One Tranquil Moment. You can find it on page 262 of this year's Write On Anthology. I hope you will enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it. One Tranquil Moment by Judith Davis Gagan Gazing mesmerised at fluffy clouds slowly drifting through a pale blue sky scented air the lush alluring fragrance of flowers speaking to the heart silence mingles with the quiet lapping of the gentle tide as a glance a kiss upon the shore rolls away then still once more the sound lulls and quells as fine silk sand through slumbered fingers flows and mind and thoughts drift into calm surrender ripples of the ebbing tides and quiet murmurs of the lapping water calling me come in come in i would like to stay like this forever sun on gleaming water shining radiant in pure delight peace closing gently over me these are the days i will remember in the winter when the dim lights of that season i encounter then i swim out slowly with the ebbing tide and just like that i sense the hint of possibility i glimpse hope skipping up the shore bending towards me whispering in the darkest storm as tides ebb and form remember to dream of a sunless morn congratulations on new books from from pat tony's barna Welcome to Monica's Grooming. My name is Monica. And I'm Kate. And congrats to the Write On group on their fab new books. Amazing. Congratulations. Well done. Hello. My name is Henry Gerrity. I live here in Barna, County Galway. And I'd like to wish the best of luck to the Write On group on their two new books. Hi, my name is Gerard from the Velvet Hairdressing Group here in Barna. And I'd like to congratulate the Write On group for the publication of their two new books. My name is Hazel from Ground & Co Barna, and I'd like to congratulate the Write On group on their two new publications of Father's Love and Other Stories and Write On Anthology 2024. We honour the memory of our esteemed Write On member, Celia Scully, who passed away in Boise, Idaho. A passionate lady who remained radiant and vibrant till her last moments, Celia had a profound love for poetry, a love that was indeed boundless. Remembering Celia. Judith David Gagan To write on members The hearts she touched still beat Her genius echoes strong Her smile we'll forever treasure And remember in our song Though her absence felt enormously 
her amazing poems endure, her gifts to us in anthology, to reference and to soothe. So let us all continue in honour of her name, to seek words that inspire a brighter, bolder flame. Switched on, Elizabeth Hannon. I start this new year driven mad by numbers, access codes, pins, user IDs. God be with the days when you shouted hello as you opened the neighbour's unlocked door. Now I can't get into my own home without entering a six digit code, have seconds to disarm, or Garthy called. My laptop, iPad and iPhone needs passwords and face recognition to keep files, email safe. Stopping others from invading my space. To get cash from my bank account, ATM, four digit PIN needed. To bank online, six digit password, BIC, IBAN and wait for approval. To get a Cade Miele voucher now, have passport, visa, back cert, bank balance ready in triplicate. Hello there, I'm Elizabeth Hannan. Once a school teacher hailing from Donegal, I now find my heart deeply rooted in the vibrant rhythms of Galway, a city I've cherished for many years. While I may have humorously chided modern technology in my poem, Switched Off. I can't deny the exciting new horizons that the Write On group have unveiled for me. It's a place where pens meet pixels, where storytelling embraces the age of videos, and where seasoned writers like myself find unexpected joy in navigating the digital realm. Ah, Furbo Beach, the whispers of the waves, the untouched sand, and the sheer joy in my grandchildren's eyes as they create sandcastles. It's a haven, and beyond, the majestic silhouette of the Burren and County Clare, leading the gaze towards the cliffs of water. I take immense pride in being a part of the Right On Group, and it warms my heart to share that my tales and verses have found a home in this year's anthology. A couple of years ago, Right On published my book, Out of the Blue. It contains stories, poems and memoirs, and I'm thrilled with it. But beyond the written word, my soul finds solace in the embrace of my garden. The petals, the fragrance, the myriad colours, to give you a taste of this passion, I present an excerpt from All in the April Evening, a piece you'll find between pages 218 and 222 of the Right On Anthology 2024. All of an April Evening by Elizabeth Hannon. My husband has COVID. I am isolating with him. Since I cannot really go anywhere, I have spent the evening contemplating my poor garden, which is in dire need of a spring clean and tidy up. Ours is a small city back garden plot, most of which is paved in sandstone slabs. I am not so much a gardener as a pofferer. We have a plethora of pots, tubs and containers, ill-matched and in varied hues, which we love, filling and moving them as the need arises. Hedge and wall to the front and high fencing to the rear 
gives us privacy, shelter and hopefully security. From my kitchen window, I can see that the budding clematis has spread from the fence to the silver birch tree, which will shortly sport a frilly pink mantilla. The other main garden tree is a weeping cherry, but though it has some beautiful pink flowers on the drooping branches, sadly, the parent tree on which this was grafted seems to be taking over, with small white cherry blossom flowers and upright branches. These are becoming a threat to the telephone wires crossing above it. Note to self, bring in a lopper. The daffodils have finished flowering, except for the real large rose-like blooms, which are a brilliant yellow splash against the wooden fence. The tulips are finished. Honestly, mine were a bit of a letdown this year. Too much rain. On our rambles through woods or past other people's gardens, I cannot resist collecting seed heads. I experience great satisfaction when these seeds produce free flowers. I asked a neighbour for a few poppy seed heads from last year's glorious crop of tall, vibrant scarlet blooms. Next morning, the entire spent plant was lying beside my car. Now I must make sure the seeds grow and flower to repay his generosity. Given the millions of tiny seeds in each seed case, surely some of them will take and flourish. What is my current favourite plant? Without a moment's hesitation, I nominate the bleeding heart plant. It looks delicate with its vibrant green leaves and soft flesh stems. In winter, it disappears completely, leaving not a trace. With spring, it resurrects itself and quickly emerges into a many-limbed, fragile shrub. Its crowning glory is the multitude of strings of red hearts that decorate it. These little emoji-like hearts elevate it into an unforgettable symbol of beauty that never fails to make me smile. Hiya, I'm Orla from Barna and congratulations to the Ride On group on their two new publications, Anthology and A Father's Love. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the store manager of Cabinet Supercollective Barna and I'd like to congratulate the Ride On group for their publication of a fabulous book of poems and short writings. And I'd also like to congratulate Frank Fahey on his publication of A Father's Love and I wish them the very best of luck in the future. Oh, my name is Atello. Here are two new fantastic books from the Right On Group. Thank you, Atello, and congratulations to the Right On Group. Hi, I'm Katie from Seapoint Medical Centre, and congratulations to the Right On Group on the Right On Anthology 2024. Greetings, I'm Michael O'Dowd. Nestled in Barna, County Galway, I've had the privilege of retiring as a medic to the calming embrace of sea breezes. My garden has become my sanctuary where blooms sway under my care. But aside from nurturing nature, I have a profound love for painting. A particular piece that's close to my heart, a vibrant depiction of Noel McGrath, a Tipperary hurler, embodying the spirit of our national sport. A few years back, I stumbled upon the Right On group, opening yet another chapter of creativity in my life. Through it, I've shared tales and melodies, eagerly anticipating the genuine, constructive feedback I receive each session. There's something enlightening about voicing your own words aloud. It reveals their harmony 
The right on community, well, they possess an uncanny ability to critique. Always genuine, always sincere. And this year's right on anthology is a masterpiece. Over 400 pages brimming with tales, verses and melodies. I invite you to savour a special treat, love songs or chansons d'amour, from pages 360 to 361, rendered soulfully by my cherished Christine and my son Michael. Enjoy! <laughs> This wondrous music floating around in your head Sing love songs to me, to the rhythm of your heart Love songs, love songs Chanson d'amour will never part Love songs, love songs Chanson d'amour lit this fire inside me now it's time you should sing love songs to me to the rhythm of your heart love songs love songs chanson d'amour we never part love songs love songs chanson d'amour we finding out what people are reading in Barna, what is the most popular book. And here in the heart of Barna we see the proprietor Seamus entering Sulala where every cup of coffee tells a story and every reader has a twist. Hey James, what do you got there? Oh, a right on book. Classic James. Anthology, very good. And Mary Rose, surely she's into something different today. Nope, another right on special. Josephine, always the wild card. But what's this? Oh, of course, right on. Stealthily, Joanne reading. You guessed it. 
right on once again. And Michael making a statement with a right on book. No surprises there. Here's Anne Murray, another right on advocate. Carmel Brennan, with a twinkle in her eye, diving deep into yet another right on adventure. And here's Geraldine now, joining the club with right on. Thumbs up to Geraldine. And the elegant Elizabeth with, you've guessed it, a right on book. Another thumbs up. And here's Seamus, always the rebel. Well, there you have it, folks. In Barna, nine out of ten cool cats choose right on. But every now and again, there's a bard in the bunch. Seamus, Ellie and Amy's blend, where every sip, behold, is a story waiting to unfold. Next time you are in Barna, make sure to drop into Sula Ella Space. As the curtain falls on this remarkable journey, we find ourselves deeply immersed in the tapestry of words and emotions we've been privileged to experience tonight. Through the eyes of the authors we've visited, the poetic cadences, heartfelt stories and soulful songs, we have traversed borders and transcended boundaries. It's a testament to the power of words to unite us, to resonate with our deepest feelings and to ignite our collective imaginations. We sincerely hope that this evening has been as enriching for you as it has been for us, bringing these diverse voices to life. If you've been inspired and wish to carry a piece of this night with you, our books await your eager hands on Amazon. To those of you with burgeoning passion for writing, eager to pen down your own tales, or simply to be part of a community that cherishes the written word, the doors of the Write On group stand open. Dive deep into our world by visiting www.writeon.ie and perhaps embark on your own journey of literary exploration. We are truly grateful to you for choosing to spend your culture night with us. As the evening breeze carries away our voices, our stories linger, weaving themselves into the tapestry of your memories. Wishing each and every one of you a serene and delightful evening. Until we meet again on paper, in verse, or in song, good night and best wishes. May words continue to light up your world.